Uh, sorry about that, goodness. One parting thought, Katie, that I thought was really interesting about your talk is you started off saying, finding places to store sediment. Uh, when I was younger and came to this conference, I'd be intimidated by the engineers that would show their, their projects and say, we're just going to move sediment through here. We're going to get all the sediment through here. And I'd scratch my head and I'd be like, man, some poor folks downstream are going to have to deal with all that. <laughs> anyway, next up is... Uh, Joel Schultes. Joel's day job is teaching water resources to civil engineering undergrads at Colorado Mesa University in Grand Junction. Uh, however, out of a combination of the American worth, work ethic, not knowing when to stop raising his hand, an overinflated sense of self-importance, and because the money is good, Joel spends most of his time working on various consulting and research projects centered on flood hazards, river management, and process-based restoration. He also thinks that he can convince Mesa County to take on a comprehensive river corridor master planning effort, which may give you a sense of the level of his self-delusion. All right, thanks a lot, Joel. Anyone who's here from Mesa County, that's a joke. <laughs> We're all working together. All right. Thank you, Chris. Um, please feel free to stretch. This is the last presentation before lunch. I know you guys have been sitting for a long time. Um, I'm gonna be talking about how stream corridor restoration influences local reach scale, water, and thermal energy fluxes. I'm mostly gonna be talking about water today. This is a talk, part of a talk that I gave earlier um, with a longer format, but we'll touch a little bit on thermal stuff at the end. Um, I wanna acknowledge the collaborators on this project. Most of them are in this room, so Buffy Length, Mark Beardsley, Aaron Richter, Bureau of Land Management, Sarah Marshall, CNHP, who's here, um, and then some students who have been working with us on this as well, Christian Mendez and Levi Rivers. So the premise of this work and kind of what we're studying is that um, we know that incision and simplification of riverscapes can reduce their ability to store water um, in the floodplain, uh, in the surface, and as well as in the subsurface. Um, so that drain that we saw earlier from the uh, Trail Creek project, um, as well as sediment and carbon. And this can reduce habitat quantity and quality and reduces, I'm gonna say, quote, resilience because we wanted to find that um, to floods, droughts, and increasing temperatures that we're experiencing. Ultimately, we want to think about ways to restore connectivity and storage. And um, by doing some of the process-based restoration approaches that we've been talking about this, this week, we can think about ways to restore hydrologic resilience, which we'll look at in a second here. So what is hydrologic resilience? Well, um, here's a nice graphic from Emily Fairfax and her co-author, Smokey the Beaver. We have disconnected systems that might be incised where um, the groundwater table is pretty low and maybe below the root zone of, of streams. The stream is um, losing to the groundwater table and kind of subsidizing this. And then we also get some rainfall, some moisture from rainfall. Um, and drought conditions, a lot of vegetation can die back because it's not connected. And then of course in fire conditions, um, a lot more vegetation is susceptible to burning. Where we are connected, meaning um, incision has been ameliorated or hasn't occurred, and where we have lateral hydrologic connectivity, um, then we have a higher water table and essentially more access for vegetation to water, which can lead to better biodiversity and habitat and food for beavers, et cetera. So here's what this looks like. I'm gonna keep it right here. Um, at Badger Creek, which we're gonna be talking about today, where Ecometrics has been working on restoration with Central Colorado Conservancy. And here's a disconnected, kind of pre-restoration situation, at different sites, but kind of same stream system. So this is that drain that Mark was talking about. And here's a restored uh, part of this, and this is what this looks like from the sky. So, um, and we'll talk about what, what actually kind of happened here. So when we think about designing or defining hydrologic resilience, um, we're thinking about how water remains in the landscape and is it sticking around for longer and where is it? Is it stored in the aquifer and surface ponds? Um, as storm flows move through this system, are we attenuating them? Meaning um, the peak is, is slowing down and being spread out and energy dissipated as well as sediment. And then um, ultimately are we augmenting and kind of maintaining biodiversity through wet and dry cycles, through fire and drought, et cetera. So here's Badger Creek watershed in the smack dab middle of Colorado. So light is right here. And here's the watershed. It's a pretty large watershed. And then here's our study reaches that we're working on. So the study sites, we've got a treated reach. 
and then an untreated reach upstream. I believe this is gonna be restored next year, so we're gonna get some nice pre and post treatment data there. The hydrology in Badger Creek is extremely flashy. The you know, base flow is about a CFS or lower, depending on where you are in that system. Sometimes the flow just goes underground. Um, and then we get rain events that are very peak. At this, this hydrograph just shows 30 CFS, but they can get hundreds of CFS moving through here if there's a good rainstorm event. So not a, not a real big flow, snow, or sorry, snow melt hydrology there. A um, little bit of snow certainly in the watershed, but a lot of that percolates in the ground and doesn't, not some big runoff event in the spring. So the challenges in this, it's a highly grazed area and Central Colorado Conservancy has been working with the BLM and the landowners, the ranchers up there to manage grazing. And uh, by kind of reducing the pressure on these lowland areas and the floodplain area, um, after a couple years, they're able to see a big bounce back in vegetation. So grazing management is kind of like that first step here. Um, and then because of that pressure, we've had a lot of incision and, and draining of these, of these kind of meadow systems, or historically meadow systems. Um, and then kind of watershed scale, huge sediment load. So there's gullying happening, aridification happening everywhere. So just a lot of sediment coming into the system, moving through the system, ultimately dumping down into the Arkansas River and then Pueblo Reservoir probably. So um, that's a concern there. And very flashy, flashy uh, hydrology from rainfall runoff. So the work that Ecometrics has been doing is um, plugging the channel. So very simple, low-tech process of, uh, we'll see some examples of just sod channel plugs that create these kind of ponded areas and then ultimately hopefully fill in uh, to the historic footprint of what this um, uh, wetland extent looks like. And then um, pr planting willows as well to get some woody vegetation back into the system. So pretty simple, but a lot of work, right? Reducing grazing pressure, that takes a lot of work. Um, going in and doing the treatments, not a ton of work, but then revisiting and making sure the willows are establishing and then ultimately maintaining this grazing management. So here's just a look at these kind of simple ponded systems. Not as beautiful as Trail Creek, but it's still um, important in its own way and it's got some really good benefits for habitat and, and pasture. So there it is from above. Um, and you'll see that, the, so essentially the water table is being elevated, we've got ponding and um, surface storage, and then what we'll look at is subsurface storage as well. So the ultimate research question that we're looking at is how does stream corridor restoration alter reach scale, so we're just looking at the reach scale, storage and flux of water. And we're doing that by looking at a number of things, and this is essentially kind of a, uh, we'll say a crude approach at looking at reach scale water balance. Um, and there's kind of like this, you could go to the NSF grant level where you're looking at kind of multiple, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment and you know, bringing in groundwater hydrologists and uh, eco-hydrologists. Um, and then you've got the kind of, let's throw some bisometers in the ground and, and take some measurements once a month or something like that. I'd say this is, we're trying to thread the needle of what can we do with, this was a CPW grant, right? Um, that funded the restoration and then we kind of tacked on a um, we'll say uh, heavy hydrologic monitoring and vegetation monitoring component. So um, this is what this looks like, or this is our kind of version of that. Uh, so we've got surface water loggers in and out, um, looking at uh, rough surface water balance, and also looking at how floods move in and out of the system. So what kind of attenuation do we get? We've got groundwater monitoring, so we've got shallow wells. These are about six to eight feet deep, and um, we're logging groundwater levels across transects, and we'll look at that in a second. So there's Buffy out there helping develop some of those wells. And um, the question of groundwater monitoring, this is kind of the big component because most of the water is underground, is um, what is the relationship between surface flows and groundwater levels and, and flow? Um, what are the groundwater contributions to stream flow? And then how much is stored in, in the subsurface? And then the other component of this water balance is then evapotranspiration. And we're gonna be estimating that with, we got a weather station, so this is our first season where we have weather station data. We have NDVI data um, at a pretty high resolution for, from satellite imagery. Um, and then we're gonna be using some kind of remote sensing techniques to basically extrapolate um, local meteorological data with this NDVI data to estimate evapotranspiration. So here's our, our configuration of the sites. We've got transects, two transects for each site. Here's our treatment site. 
Um, so these are groundwater transects. We've got surface water loggers. Um, and then here's our control site where we haven't had treatment yet. So we're going to look at some of the groundwater data here and then see what this looks like. Um, this was from 2021. So we've got a lot of good rain events that happened that summer. And then we have, this is just a groundwater elevation. And we can see that it's pretty responsive to these rain events. So it's coming up um, uh, many, you know, this is meters, but uh, we'll say many centimeters, tens of centimeters. And you can also see the signal of when the restoration occurred. So the restoration occurred and then the water level went up by um, greater, I think it was about a foot and a half, two feet at this particular location. And then we'll look at how uh, the, the gradient or the slope of water moving from this direction. So we can think of groundwater moving from the hill slopes laterally to the channel and contributing to base flow. And then with these transects, we're gonna be able to look at that slope, the slope of that. Um, water table and then ultimately the gradients and then with hydraulic conductivity measurements which we're going to be taking this fall we'll be able to estimate some some flow rates from that so we're going to be just looking at a well that's close to the channel so near and then a well that's farther away from the channel and we're going to be looking at the relative elevations of those two um, so here is groundwater elevation at the uh, let's see here I got these mixed up that's okay I got my pictures mixed up. But so um, what we're looking at here is the um, kind of relationship, which, which we're looking at the elevation, which one is above the other. And so if far is above near, that means the water is sloping to the channel and we're contributing to the base flow, essentially the hill slope groundwater table is con contributing to base flows. And then when that switches, when near goes above far, then um, we get, let's see here, uh, here we go, so near is above far, then we get water going in the opposite direction. So the stream is contributing to the water table. Um, so here is uh, what we call losing conditions. So the stream is losing water to the ground table or the groundwater table and contributing, kind of recharging essentially. And then gaining is when kind of under base flow conditions where we have water coming from the hill slope. So we just looked at the percent of time that we had these losing versus gaining conditions. So losing water, leaving the stream back into the water table, gaining water going from the water table back into the stream. And then, so this is our, I, I got the pictures mixed up here. I was, put this in last night, so. <laughs> um, so this is the wet, you know, restored treatment reach, and then this is our control reach. So just flip those pictures in your brain if you can. And uh, so under the control reach, we, we lost, meaning we recharged from the stream to the water table about 2% of the time over our study period. So it's during these flood events where the water table is really elevated. You can think about flow kind of spreading out across the floodplain. And then if we got our treatment reach, it was about 9% of the time. Not a lot of time, you know, in the grand scheme of things. However, we had certainly, if you compare these two, that's... 400% more time, so that's kind of a big number, but you know, it's, it's still small, and what does that mean to you know, late season base flow, which everyone kind of is hoping these kinds of projects will do. So that's one of the things we're exploring. But um, we're, we're certainly recharging the water table a lot longer, and then we're gonna be looking at how long, what does that mean for the kind of post storm and, and late season flows and, and contributions. So this is what this looks like from a cartoon. This is something we know about. Um, under base flow conditions, the water table is contributing to the stream, and then under higher stage conditions, we've got essentially a reverse in the gradient, and so we have essentially hydraulic pressure that can drive water back out into the banks and the floodplain. So there's a lot more questions that we're pursuing here, um, just from a storage standpoint, how much additional water is stored in the surface and subsurface across these two sites. How long does that water remain in groundwater storage and then is metered out? Is this something that just lasts for days, which it kind of looks like? Um, or is it something that we can quantify in terms of weeks and, and months, but probably just on the order of days here? Um, and then what is the magnitude of evapotranspiration? Does it vary from one reach to the next? Can we actually, you know, given the uncertainty in ET measurements, we don't have a flux tower here and we're not doing kind of, you know, loss of latent heat from the system, that sort of thing. Um, but given kind of like pretty decent methods of, eva of evaluating ET, which um, we use in other areas across the state, can we A, see a difference between the two sites and then B, per unit length? And then B, if we were to translate that to a volume and a flow rate, is that something we could actually measure? 
like in a, in a, a stream gauge or a flume, um, something that you know, water rights folks scrutinizing that might, might care about. Um, so this, I would say, what we're doing is kind of like mid-tech. Um, there are a lot of low-tech options and um, um, a lot of people who are out there are doing this. So first, like, what are your goals or your projects? So we want to do monitoring, great. What do you want to monitor and why? And so think about that. What are your outcomes of your project? Is it veg and habitat focus? Then monitor that. If you want to think about hydrology, then um, uh, Ecometrics team ha has some great you know, methods of just driving in some shallow wells and going out there and measuring it on a weekly or monthly basis to see how things are changing with a groundwater table. Um, let's see here. Uh, I'm going to be blinking on a name, but um, uh, let's see here. So um, the folks from Blue Shift are looking at the um, flows, and there's some great low-tech ways using field cameras. So you can put a stream um, uh, staff gauge in there and then use a field camera to watch that over a storm event and go back and identify stream stage over time. So that's an easier way than using a, a logger, potentially. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things we can do that's, that are low-tech, and I think the Walton Family Foundation is supporting a project that will come up with some more kind of basic methods we can use to do this. All right, so uh, just a, a look at like bringing this down to what does reach scale restoration do for hydrology? And there's a, a study that was published by Andy Bobst in 2022. Um, the work, I think he did this work about five years ago, but we finally got a paper out. So just wanted to summarize that. And he, at the end, the authors came up with kind of three restoration scenarios based on the properties of your valley and properties of your aquifer. So. Um, if we've got some kind of real big hydrologic goals, let's talk with some groundwater folks to really understand what the potential is for your site. So the first was, okay, do we just want to think about sub-irrigation, um, increase riparian productivity for grazing and stuff like that? That's often a goal, so that's great. Um, we can think about recharge to the stream at the reach scale, and then we can think about longer-term storage to uh, downflow, uh, sorry, downstream stream flow. So um, sub-irrigation, well, we want to think about areas where the water isn't going to be draining quickly, so lower hydraulic conductivity, meaning finer aquifer properties, shallower aquifers. So these are areas where you can have meet these goals more readily. Um, groundwater recharge to the stream, well, think about off-channel storage. So this study looked at, well, what happens when we put a pond here to the overall water table at the reach scale? So putting in off-channel, on-channel storage, that creates these um, kind of water towers, essentially from the perspective of the water table. So that those are areas that are able to then contribute to um, elevated water tables that can contribute to stream flow later in the season. And then finally, for if you're thinking about longer term, meaning multi-year storage, increased stream flows further downstream, so outside of the reach scale, well, think about um, areas where if you're doing the restoration on a particular reach, maybe you're restoring um, or increasing hydrologic connectivity, increasing um, recharge of the water table at a certain location that can then translate to flows further downstream. But um, it's going to be based on the permeability of the aquifer and the valley configuration. So is there some reason for that water to come back into the stream down, downstream because the water table, or sorry, the aquifer thins up and you get a bedrock um, area downstream that kind of forces the water back into the stream. So getting water from the water table into the stream isn't super straightforward, and there's a lot to consider there. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, so next steps, we're going to be conducting those reach scale evapotranspiration measurements this winter. Um, we'll be going about out in two weeks and praying for no snow. So we got snowed out this spring. and. Um, uh, collect our loggers, our meteorological data. We're going to do some slug testing to be able to answer some of those more groundwater questions. We're going to do some cores, uh, evaluate the aquifer material. Um, yeah, and so a lot more to come, which is exciting. All right, I've got about, I don't know, two minutes maybe. So I want to just briefly refer to um, thermal fluxes in refuge for, in, in this case, salmon. And this is on the Grand Ronde River in Oregon. This is a project that I got to get off the ground when I was at Bureau of Reclamation and then trying to keep it alive and going um, from, the, from the sidelines now. So uh, this is something I think that we can think more about here in Colorado. It's something that people have been working on for years in the Pacific Northwest for salmon as the streams heat up and salmon have a real low tolerance for warm water. 
And um, the restoration work that they're, they're doing out there, so this is partnerships between um, uh, tribes out there. So this is confederated tribes of the Umatilla Reservation and then Bureau of Reclamation, University of Idaho. So Reclamation is working with the tribes to identify areas where we can restore hyper flow paths or enhance them. So this is an area where they actually constructed this. They put in coarser material that would try to drive flow through this meander bend. And then looked at the surface water temperatures in the main channel and then this alcove that was constructed and, and connected at the outlet of this constructed hyperic flow path. And just to look at the kind of summer temperatures, they were able to maintain flow or um, temperatures below this cold water criterion for, for salmon. And, and the main channel went quite above that. And there's not a lot of flow coming out here. If you think about like the net cooling effect of this, it's not cooling the main channel. However, it is providing a hydrologically connected cooler refuge for salmon. So during the peak warm period of the day, this is an opportunity for salmon to go and enjoy a colder area. Um, so this is, that's a different stream now, the Grand Ronde River, the existing channel was here. This has already been restored a few years ago now. Um, and then we're looking at, well, what hyper flow paths are being restored here. So this was the original configuration. Now we've got all these side channels that they've tapped into and um, augmented. And so we're looking at different scales. We've got riffle, hyper flow, we've got plan form, and then these kind of long side channel hyper flow paths. A um, lot of data has been collected. We've got wells, we've got um, dozens of, of surface water and stage loggers that are looking at um, just what's happening in the field. And then there's a model, and that's what University of Idaho is working on. So we've got a surface 2D surface hydraulic model and then a, a mod flow. And then we're trying to couple those, which is challenging. So um, that's currently the struggle right now. But they're essentially going to say, OK, you've got so much energy coming in here. And where does that energy go as it moves through the system? And then what does that contribute to temperature at different points in the system? So we've got a big spring runoff event that comes through and kind of you know, wets the sponge, so to speak. But what does that mean? And how long does that last? Um, and does that translate to colder temperatures in August and September? So there's this um, quasi unsteady component of it, that's going to evaluate what, how long does it take for this water to move through that colder water and then outlets, is it weeks, days, or months, that kind of thing. So um, something that hopefully information from this we can, we can learn and, and apply to restoration practice and think about uh, not only storing water for flow's sake, but storing water for temperature sake as well. So some, some summary of this is we're investigating reach scale flow paths, storage and flux of water. Um, we need more data on this to understand what's actually happening with our restoration projects. Uh, where are we um, able to store water? How long does it last? And will that meet the hydrologic objectives that we often hope of the, or often you know, say we have of these projects? This is one particular site, one particular type of restoration approach. And I hope to be able to apply this to some like like a Taylor Creek, for example, or somewhere where we've got more kind of off-channel ponding, different kinds of aquifer, that kind of thing. I mean, ultimately, you know, Peter's talking about scaling this up. This information can then feed into kind of more water scale mod watershed scale modeling of um, uh, natural infrastructure. So that's hopefully where this can go. Great. Thanks for your attention. All hands should be raised. Thank you. Um, I was really curious for the Badger Creek project, where specifically in the Badger Creek do you think the flooding is occurring? Because when you have the flooding, is it at the bottom of the drain pipe? How is it that the surface water is flowing through? I'll give you my answer, then I bet you Mark and Buffy could probably answer it way better than I could. But um, the whole watershed is experiencing you know, incision and degradation, so gullying. Um, from the hill slopes, there's a lot of work back in the 70s, I think, and 60s to try to arrest that. Um, so a lot of that was delivered down into the channel. And then you can also see in the topography that um, uh, the channels, there's a t been terracing. So there's, the floodplain itself has been probably stripped and, and um, sediment recruited from the floodplain itself, uh, simply because the vegetation's gone and um, it's so flashy. So everywhere. <laughs>
I'm not a not a groundwater hydrologist, but I'll just put an asterisk on that. <laughs> trying learning to be one. Yeah. <laughs> From the people in the group, like what, what resources can you point to? We're all admitting we need more water and we just really want to make sure that we have lots of water. And what's your point of other things that might help us? Uh, I actually think funding around these types of things is essential. If we came up with a strategy that was manageable enough that still did a Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> So that's an interesting thought. Yeah, I like that. Um, Maybe it's not enough to get water too. <laughs> Buffy can probably speak to this better, but um, yes, 100%, that's hand in hand, and they provided a ton of funding and materials for this particular project, and also just for the overall management, grazing, and that sort of thing. But yeah, they're, they're there. Um, well, I don't know what the restoration folks wanted to see necessarily. Um, there's a lot of great papers that came out in like the late 2000s, um, and Jeff Poole's group that looked at hyperreic flow paths and time sequences, and so the really long paths that can that can bring about net cooling um, and really dramatic buffering um, are really slow and few, and so you don't get a lot of actual you know, main channel cooling from that. So there's short paths, we have a lot of those. They don't really provide a lot of cooling, but maybe some buffering and lag. Um, so at the end of the day, no one expects this necessarily at the reach scale to cool the main stem. The, the thermal load in the main stem is just so high and big and dramatic, especially in the Grand Ronde River. It's just a very hot river. Um, however, if we do that at the watershed scale, that could be a different story. Um, and they actually studied the watershed here, did a whole thermal model of the watershed to think about how much tree planting would we need to do. And I don't know if they looked at hyperreic, um, because that's a little harder to model, but certainly it's going to take a lot to reduce net uh, mainstream temperatures. Yeah. Great. Um, but yeah, I'll not take your question, but I will say that everyone was excited to see that. I mean, that's huge, right? It's like, hey, there's a cold spot that fish can go to. So yes, <laughs> there was excitement, yeah.
Um, we place them essentially near next to the channel, but in, not in an area that's going to like erode per se. So just get close, three feet, something like that. Um, the, the groundwater, that aquifer is pretty conductive, so things flow very quickly. So I mean, up to six feet would probably be fine. I just wanted to get what's the table next to the channel, approximate to the channel. And then we went to essentially the edge of the terrace, um, so that there's like a floodplain, and then then uh, up. To, you know, level step up to the next terrace. And so we tried to go as far back as we could to try to get, because the gradients are pretty minute. Um, so we want to, the farther back you go, the more change in elevation you can see. Um, so we wanted to go back all the way out. And as high up as we could um, with us, we didn't have the ability to go very deep. Um, so basically as far as you can go in a way that you still can capture the water table um, and get that gradient, whichever way it's going. Um, I will say what we're doing with the surface water. So that idea came from Caroline, the game camera, Caroline Nash. Um, and um, so I haven't, I haven't used that yet, but it seems like a thing that could work well. It's really hard, though, to go from stage to discharge in an open channel, and the measurements are super uncertain. And so I say we're doing that, but it's like really uncertain and really rough. So you need a flume uh, to actually measure things. Yeah. Oh, cool. There's going to be an app for that. There's a lot of really smart people that can do that that would really act like an interpreter for the water. Yeah. So I, for us, like, if we wanted to really get, like, input and output, we, we tried to install some, some weirs and failed, um, and I almost, uh, you know, like, killed myself doing that and <laughs> others that were there um, mentally. But we, we got through it. Um, flumes, at the end of the day, are going to be the best to quantify that in a way that's kind of meaningful from a water balance perspective. So it's this, this open channel gauging thing. On small streams, it's really hard because you have like three inches of water and it's really hard to get velocity measurements. So I'm just going to say that, but um, it's, it's something you can do for sure. And, and you can certainly compare hydrographs or stage hydrographs from, for, and get some information from that. So. Okay, right. so Thanks. Uh,